This is the JT Podcast, brought to you by the Baltimore Jewish Times and its parent company, Mid-Atlantic Media. This episode originated from the Baltimore Jewish Times sister publication, The Philadelphia Jewish Exponent. Welcome to the Jewish Exponent Podcast. I am your host, Jared Safran. I'm here today with Stephen Weiss, a survivor of the 2018 Tree of Life synagogue shooting, the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history. Stephen, thank you for joining us. You uh, are a part of this documentary called Tree of Life on HBO Max that the Federation in Philadelphia here is screening later this week. So you are in town. You're going to be doing some security trainings alongside that at Har Zion and Road of Shalom in the Philadelphia area. And you're joining us here today. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Certainly. So you, your experience that day has been out there in some media outlets, but I do want to ask you to kind of take us through it just because I don't know if a lot of our Philadelphia area audience has heard it from your perspective specifically. It's also in the HBO doc that you are interviewed in, but just take me through your experience that day. Certainly. I was there for services like any normal Shabbat morning. Yeah. And I was actually sitting in the chapel in the very back pew. There were 12 of us in the chapel when services started at 945. Mm -hmm. And I guess there were two people sitting behind me that really served as ushers. And in the front of the room, um, Audrey Glickman was leading the starting portion of the service. About six or seven minutes into the service, we were doing what's called the Kaddish de Rabbanan, a prayer that's recited after learning, and it requires a minyan, a quorum of at least 10 adults to be present. The rabbi had actually started leading that prayer, and as he was about halfway through the prayer, there was a loud crashing sound. To me, it sounded like the custodian was setting up for the meal that we would have after we would be done with services and had dropped a tray of glasses. As soon as that tray sound occurred, the two people behind me that were the ushers went running out to check and see what was going on. I went to the back doors and I stayed by the doors going out into the hallway as the rabbi was continuing with the prayer. And if I left, he would not have a minion. I guess about 30 seconds or so later, as he was finishing that prayer, there were a series of shots and I'm standing in the doorway waiting to go out. And I actually see shell casings bouncing across the floor in front of me. I turned around and came back into the room and I went to the side aisle in that room. And as I got there, the rabbi announced for everybody to get down. I was probably the third youngest person in that room. And so I started to get down. And as I started to get down, I remembered a training that Brad Orsini, who at that time was the Federation Security Specialist for Pittsburgh, um, he had shown us a video of a shooting in Fort Lauderdale Airport. And he stressed the point about how people were hiding in plain sight. Yes, so you were the uh, religious school director at Tree of Life, correct? And you had been- No, we had a, at that time we had a principal I was teaching some of the classes. Okay. But you had been through a security training the year before. Yes. Yeah. In September of 2017, Brad came in and did this training for us. Yeah. And that's when he stressed this idea of staying out of sight, if there's any way to do that. Yeah. And so as I started to get down, that video just popped back into my mind. And I knew that getting down by that back bench, the pew in the room wouldn't give me any kind of real security. Yeah, so don't just hide. Like, make sure you are out of sight. Like, they can't just turn something over and find you. Is that the idea? Well, there really wasn't even turning something over. If you would have walked down that center aisle in that room, I would have been visible. Yeah. And so I knew that wasn't the right thing to do. So I ran to the front of the room and up across the BIMA, the elevated platform in the front of the room, Mm and out a door that was on the BIMA that would take you into a back area. As I was going out of that room, there was shooting beginning in the room behind me. I went 
down a little hallway and down to our basement area. We had three congregations all together that would be meeting in our building on a Saturday morning. We were in the chapel. Dor Hadash, a reconstructionist group, would be in what was originally the rabbi's study. And, <clears throat> and New Light would be in the lower basement area. I could not get to the area where Dor Hadash was meeting because I would have to go across the area where the shooter was. But I was able to go down a back stairway to warn the downstairs group. As I got downstairs and I was warning that group, you could still hear shooting taking place upstairs. When I was done, I turned around and started to go back upstairs. And as I was getting toward the top of those steps, I heard shooting beginning downstairs. I knew if the shooting was downstairs <clears throat> that I would be able to go out. So I continued down this hallway into our main sanctuary. And I was able to go across the main sanctuary and out onto the side street and wait for the police to come. As I was going behind the bima, I did see the rabbi on his phone already calling 911. So I knew that the police would be arriving momentarily. We're literally two blocks from the synagogue to be at the police station. So I was outside for about a minute when the first patrol car pulled up. I was able to tell the officers exactly where the shootings were taking place, and they went running towards the main entrance of the building. When they got to the main entrance, the shooter started shooting through the door, which was a glass door, at them, and he wounded the one officer in the hand. <clears throat> at that point, that officer came back around to the side of the building where I was, and he was insisting that I move farther away because there was active shooting taking place in the area. A couple minutes later, our custodian came out. And of course, he was wearing a blue uniform. And when he came out, other police officers had arrived. And of course, they drew down on him when he came out of the building. And I was able to identify and tell them who he was. About a minute later, the rabbi from the downstairs congregation came out around the back of the building, and at that point, the police moved us farther from the area. So I wasn't really able to do much of anything else until that night when we met at the Jewish Community Center, and we found out you know, exactly what had happened in terms of who had been wounded, who had been killed. When you, how has that experience affected you over the years? Well, <clears throat> I've really taken something very strongly from this experience. Yeah. I did not want to go to that training on, you know, September the 8th of 2017. Mm -hmm. I felt, that, you know, our synagogue is a small synagogue. You know, it's going to be a waste of time. Why am I going to bother? But as part of the school faculty, I was required to attend. Yeah. At that point, what I've taken from that is that if I didn't have the training, I would have been down by that back pew, and I would have probably been the 12th victim. So I've taken on, on myself to really try to get the idea of this training out there so that other people will have the same opportunity that I did by going through the training. Yeah. So this training saved your life, you believe, and it can save others too, potentially. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have been very public about this experience and about participating in these trainings in the five plus years since this tragedy. I think you just started to explain this, but why is it so important to you to do that? Well, I I really think that um, I, I totally believe that if I did not have this training, I would not be sitting here talking with you now. Mm -hmm. I would have been another victim because I wouldn't have known what to do and I would have stayed in that room. Everybody that was in that room, that stayed in the room, seven were killed, one was wounded. The other four of us escaped. Yeah. So if I had stayed in that room, statistically, I would have been another victim. And is that what you say when you're at a lot of these trainings? Is that some of the advice that you give people? Absolutely, it is, yes. Yeah, what else do you say? I try to let them know that we do have some control, even in the worst of situations. Yeah. But we have to be able to think and to react right. and not to freeze. Yeah. Um, and 
what is the reaction usually when you talk about this? Do people feel the seriousness of it or is it hard for them? Because they probably never, luckily, they probably never experienced something like this. You know, I think that they kind of take the idea that this does really happen. Yeah, It's not happening in the Jewish communities around the world. Yeah, And, you know, we need to prepare ourselves to be able to deal with it as best as it's possible to do. So I, I do think they take it very seriously. I'm, I was a teacher in the Pittsburgh public schools. Right. And we had actually had an Alice drill, which is another active shooter that's um, training that's done the Thursday before the shooting. And the kids took it as a big joke. You know, it was something that it was a way to get out of some class time. I was a middle school teacher. Yeah. Well, after the shooting, when I came back and was able to share my experiences with my students and the social worker was with me when I would do this, we saw a real change in the students' reaction to when the trainings would take place and when we would do these active shooter drills. And they did take it much more seriously. And so if 13-year-old kids, 12-year-old kids can do that, I'm sure that the adults can also take something from it that they can use. You seem to be okay with talking about this experience to as, as hard as that may be internally. Um, why do you think you're able to do that really over and over? I I think part of my, I guess my build as a teacher is to want to help my students to achieve the best that they can. And I've kind of taken this a step farther where now I'm trying to help teach the Jewish community at large that we aren't powerless. We do have ways that we can try to help mitigate what's happening. We have seen it in the Philadelphia area synagogues adopt many different security measures since the Tree of Life shooting, locks on the doors, guards, cameras, uh, lights in the parking lot, things like that, all sorts of measures. Which measures do you feel are necessary for synagogues in this day and age, especially post-October 7th, too? Yes, well, I actually have moved out of Pittsburgh, and I live in a small community called Lebanon, Pennsylvania now. And... I guess one of the things that has made our synagogue feel the most comfortable is that we have hired a security guard to be there when we have services. Yeah. So that we feel that there is somebody there to be between us and anything else that might happen. Um, we have put cameras, as you said, in the building. We've done a lot of things. We've had trainings. And I think that um, the first step has to be the trainings. Yeah. And after that, I would say putting security guards in place would be the next step. Yeah, the we interviewed on this podcast Yoni Ari, who is an Israeli. He works with the Federation on certain security trainings as well. And what he always says is that the community needs to be able to respond first. Because sure, you can call the police. You called the police on the day of the Tree of Life shooting, but it's going to take them time to get there, even if they get there pretty quickly. So the community needs to be prepared to respond itself. Is that, do you agree with that? It is. You know, what they say in the trainings is that it usually takes anywhere from two to five minutes for the police to arrive in most yeah. urban areas. Right. And you need to have a way that you can survive for that two to five minutes. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's part of what this training is all about, is helping you know that there are things you can do to give you that two to five minutes. What does it say about the state of Judaism in America that we have to take all these measures now just to both protect ourselves and maintain our peace of mind? Well, unfortunately, it's not even just America. It's, it's around the world. Yeah. Um, the Secure Community Network puts out a daily, during the week, a daily um, update of activities that have taken place around the world. And, you know, we see that it's not just here. But with the prevalence of <clears throat> of firearms in this country, you know, I think that we're seeing more attacks taking place with firearms than other parts of the world are. Yeah. So you think it's it's that? And is it anything else? Well, I think that there is a certain level of of, of distrust going on of government itself. Yeah. And I think we see an eroding of the function that our government has served to keep its citizens safe 
Yeah. And so this isn't just happening in Jewish synagogues and day schools, but it's happening, you know, in churches and the shootings in schools is crazy, you know, but it's just taking place more and more. And, you know, before Columbine, you almost never heard about any of this. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that our society is heading in a direction that is very dangerous for everybody. But I think Jews are some of the biggest targets of that everybody. Mm -hmm. You still go to synagogue just out in Lebanon now, not in Pittsburgh, a tree of life. How do you feel today when you go to synagogue? I feel that that's part of what we do as Jews. Yeah. And, you know, if I would stop going, I think that I would be saying that they won. And I'm never going to do that. Well said. Stephen Weiss, thank you very much. Thank you.